So I'm going to kick it off. Um, my name is Ari Schwartz. I'm with Local Progress. And welcome to the How to Win Development That Lifts Communities briefing webinar. Um, for those of you who are joining us via computer, you should see a quick polling question that we put up there just to um, give people the opportunity to weigh in on some of the specific issues related to this topic that you're dealing with and um, how we can keep our work going forward on this on this matter. So um, this briefing is the second one that we've done this year as part of our local progress economic justice work. And um, it comes after earlier in the year we did a briefing called Building Worker Power, uh, which was about ways that local elected officials can support efforts um, to build worker power, especially after the Janus case that attacked the right to organize. So while this briefing is a bit different and it touches on a lot of issues related to development and community benefits, we do know that one really key aspect of this conversation is how we can ensure that workers and communities impacted by development are empowered in that process to win good union jobs. So I wanted to just give that context. Um, we, of course, coming out of today are ready to, to help out um, and support all of your efforts in your jurisdictions around um, development and community benefits. And we hope that today's call will spur some ideas and draw some connections for you. So we have a really phenomenal and jam-packed lineup today. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go over the agenda and some logistics so that we can get right to it. Um, our, our main goal for today is to give Local Progress members and staff the tools, um, some examples, some creative strategies to achieve community benefits and high standards on development projects and corporate negotiations. And we see this as definitely a, a continuation of a, um, our work that we've done on this already with you all and your all's leadership. And it won't be the end of it. So coming out today, we expect to have a lot more work to do. Um, a couple quick housekeeping issues. Um, we're going to uh, schedule to end at 5 p.m. Eastern. So we're going to save questions for the end uh, in order to make sure all our speakers get enough time. I expect there will be plenty of time for questions. And so you can um, uh, ask any of the speakers or all of them a question at the end. Um, if you are joining the webinar, uh, from your computer, you can click the raise hand button if you want to ask a question, or you can submit a question through the Q&A box that you should see on the interface there. If you're joining us by phone, uh, you'll have to submit your questions by text or email because the software doesn't allow us to unmute you, unfortunately. Um, you can text 443-604-3891 or email info at localprogress.org. Uh, that's 443-604-3891 or info at localprogress.org with any questions. Okay, so with that, um, let's jump into our agenda. So first, um, we have Mia Seka Chen, who is the staff attorney at the Partnership for Working Families. After her, we'll have Councilmember Colby Sledge and Odessa Kelly from Nashville. Uh, then we're going to Dallas, where we have Councilmember Omar Narvaez. And then finally, Councilman Bill Henry in Baltimore um, will talk to us, and then we'll do questions. Uh, so I will turn it over now to Mia, who um, is with the Partnership for Working Families, one of our go-to partners on community and economic development. And Mia provides legal assistance and guidance for communities all over the country to build power in communities. Of power. So Mia, please take us away. Thanks, Ari. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, my, thanks so much, Ari. It's an honor to join you all. Um, I'm a, an attorney with the Partnership for Working Families, like Ari mentioned, and we're a national network of 19 regional advocacy organizations across the country that are helping drive community-led progressive change locally. Um, our organizations are leading multiracial coalitions and advocating for policies to protect low-wage workers and tenants, create local jobs, create greater transparency and democracy in the development process, and winning community benefits agreements for large-scale projects. Um, so as is increasingly clear um, in metro regions across the country, 
investment in economic development, transit, and infrastructure can present a threat or an asset for communities, especially low-income communities of color. Development can present a threat when it's just a big market rate building catering to wealthy consumers. Um, and that kind of development can mean low wage jobs, displacement of residents and local businesses, greater economic and racial segregation and increased traffic and sprawl. But there's a different path. If development is done right, it can mean good jobs with real career pipelines for residents, affordable housing, community services, healthy food access, green space, and environmental benefits, all of which stabilize and strengthen community. Local officials like yourselves and community allies want the positive version, but are often faced with the question of how to get there. Our frame is that public land should be used for the public good. In hot market cities, which make up most of the metro regions of the country today, public land is extremely valuable, increases in value, and is our greatest asset. Local governments are in a position to not just sell off land and give away subsidies to corporate actors who in turn promise job creation. We saw the trend with the recent Amazon HQ2 news about how cities were vying to be the next Amazon headquarters location. And we see it happen time and time again with other corporate developers. No, community-based equitable development is not that narrow. For example, we need only look at Seattle where Amazon was founded and rents have risen almost 40% over the past five years. The rate of homelessness in the city now surpasses that of other major cities, including New York and Los Angeles. And Amazon, the city's largest employer, ran a sex successful campaign to repeal a tax that would have applied only to the city's largest companies, those grossing at least $20 million a year, and that was meant to help alleviate the city's affordable housing crisis. Amazon is a company that wields incredible influence. It doesn't like taxes and it is not afraid to throw limitless resources and use all of its leverage against them in the city. So local governments do not have to give away their tax base, their land, and often their power and democratic control to corporations. They can instead take a more proactive stance and incorporate how valuable public land is on the front end and as a tool for getting development that truly benefits the community. A successful community benefits approach requires work on a number of fronts, from working with community stakeholders to develop priorities, to getting developer buy-in and working the politics, to smart policy and legal work. There are five strategies that we've seen put to successful use. They are, one, demanding strong community benefits and government agreements with employers, with, with developers. Two, encouraging negotiation of private community benefits agreements between developers and community coalitions, like you'll hear about in Nashville. Three, enacting ordinances and policies that establish baseline community benefits for future projects. Four, incorporating community benefits into land use planning and policy. And five, convening key stakeholders to reach agreement on community benefits principles for future projects. Through all of these strategies, it is vital that elected officials work in close partnership with community, making sure community organizations have the information and opportunities they need to participate fully in economic <laughs> development decisions. We have lots of resources at forworkingfamilies.org and have worked successfully with coalitions and local governments to win these community benefits in cities across the country. And we love to be in touch on these strategies in your cities and work closely with local partnership as well. Um, thanks so much, Ari, that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mia. I expect that, um, we're gonna have a lot of questions, so hopefully you can hang on till the end. We can field questions at that time. Sounds good. Um, and again, for those of you uh, on the webinar, please feel free to, to use the, the Q&A box to submit questions, um, or you can email us at info at localprogress.org. So I'm gonna turn it over now to 
Nashville, where we are really lucky to be joined by two folks, uh, Council Member Colby Sledge uh, from District 17 and Odessa Kelly, uh, who is a, a leader with the Stand Up Nashville Coalition. And they're going to talk to us about the fairgrounds development where um, a landmark community benefits deal was struck over a new soccer stadium and some of the lessons learned and, and tips they have coming out of that process. So, uh, Colby and Odessa, are you with us? Uh, I'm here. Hi, Colby. Hey. <laughs> yeah, you guys, can you guys hear me all right? Yes, we can. Please awesome. take it okay. away. Yeah, sure. So, um, thanks for the opportunity to do this, and thanks for everybody who's been calling in. Um, so, I'm going to basically just set what the political environment stage was and then turn it over to Odessa because she helped lead the negotiations. Um, basically, what occurred in Nashville is we were uh, shortlisted by Major League Soccer as a potential expansion city. And truthfully, Nashville was probably at the bottom of that list when it first started. Um, there was a local uh, billionaire, uh, essentially, who made the bid for the team and we found out uh, about this time last year that actually Nashville had been selected. Um, we did an interesting sort of bond issue in which the bonds were to be repaid by the private owner, um, but it was going, the stadium was slated to sit on public land, um, just uh, like was discussed. Uh, that public land was, um, at the fairgrounds which is owned by the city even though it's called the state fairgrounds so bond issue was given but we still had a rezoning uh to do and that rezoning which was to call for 10 basically 10 uh, acres of mixed use development um was going to be uh, basically the leverage point for what we could do for a community benefits agreement now I want to point out that Tennessee is a high preemption state. So the state legislature loves to preempt what local uh, municipalities do. So we knew that we had to do something a little different in order to ensure that a CBA could stand up and could also reflect what the community's values were. So that is where Stand Up Nashville comes in. And I'll let Odessa kind of take you through kind of what that negotiating process looked like. Uh, thanks, Kobe. Um, yeah, uh, to, I mean, okay, let's back up a little bit. I think there's a lot of things that, uh, went in, in play with that. Uh, Nashville is what they're considering the it city. We're one of the fastest growing cities in the country. So we have a couple of issues that are going on here in Nashville that also, uh, help us get, uh, to the community benefits agreement. Uh, one of those issues being that housing is an issue here in Nashville. So um, I think there was a report uh, did that said by 2025, uh, we'll need 31,000 units of affordable housing. You know, uh, the working class in Nashville is just disappearing. And of course that affects uh, minority communities um, immensely. Uh, on top of that too, here in Nashville, another problem that we have is that our unemployment level is lower than the national average. You would think that's great, but our poverty level tinkers anywhere between 17 and 20 percent, right? That's horrendous. And what we found out is that Nashville is underemployed. And by that, I mean those people who have college degrees, who are teachers, um, who work for Metro government, who are part of the infrastructure of the city are having issues, you know, surviving here in the city. So um, with that, you know, uh, we have our <clears throat> We have our city, our indigent hospital, uh, Metro, which was about to be shut down. And that's the hospital where everyone goes to is if they don't have health care, the indigent go uh, uh, to get care. And they, they were saying there was no funding for that. So that was a big issue um, that got the uh, galvanized all the people. And then on top of that, too, we had a big transit uh, referendum here in Nashville, they got voted down. So we were already at a place in Nashville where a lot of people were appalled at some of the things that were going on in Nashville and uh, just where we were as a city. So with the soccer stadium coming on, when we had uh, more humanitarian crisis going on in the city, um, it, get, it, lay, it laid the ground, um, the groundscape for us to able to go in and talk to the community about why it was important that we got some of the community benefit uh, benefits agreement on the soccer stadium. Um, one of the biggest things that happened is that uh, we had Kobe um, trusted in us enough to bring us to the table to meet with uh, to um, meet with National Soccer Holders, which was the ownership group um, of the soccer team. 
Um, I'd say we started, what, Kobe, around May, I believe? Yeah, uh, yeah, April or May, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, April was some discussions. I think we first sat down in May, and we didn't sign the agreement to Labor Day to give you uh, an idea of how long the negotiations took. Um, in the community benefits agreement, as you can look at the graph, uh, here are some of the um, main things that we got accomplished in it. Um, the biggest couple of things being the affordable housing, um, the workforce development program that we got uh, put in and uh, some of the community spaces. Uh, as I said before, there's affordable housing in Nashville is, is leaving. And uh, in the district that Kobe is in, one of the things that he has uh, been at the forefront of leading is how do I bring affordable housing into this community that makes sense? So the community benefits agreement was a good way for us to do that. Uh, I would say it was by far, I, uh, I don't, it was the, one of the hardest fights that we had, you know. Um, one of the things that I can say is that uh, it went a long way for us not to be adversarial uh, with Metro Council. Um, we really took it upon ourselves to make sure that we uh, talked with one another. Um, this is a private agreement but we wanted to make sure that they were informed on every step of the way that we were going through uh, this uh, situation and that um, it was important for uh, National Soccer Holdings and the Ingrams and the community to know that we were working together and they had, we, had, they, we had the support of Metro Council in uh, what was prioritized for Nashville if we wanted to have this soccer stadium. So I wanted to preach, uh, say thank you to Kobe because that went a long way in just changing the dynamics and how we interact with Metro Council. A lot of times when you see Metro Council or you see like a mayor's office, you know, um, they kind of pitted against the community or, at, uh, or activists, and if that was not the case in this situation. Um, I think us passing the CBA has really intertwined the two, and I think it's worked well in both ways that we know that we truly can go to our elected officials and really talk about what's best for the working class and the people of Nashville, and the same for them to uh, know that they can work with the people in the community and not have to you know, take a deep breath every time you see us coming to uh, Council Hall. Uh, but with that said, um, <clears throat> uh, I guess I just go through a, a couple of things um, that happened. Uh, the biggest thing was us defining what it is that we re uh, really want to get out of this agreement. And uh, that takes a lot of work. You know, like uh, the reason I spoke about the temperament of Nashville earlier was because a lot of times as activists, or uh, as an organizational coalition, we'll go out and try to get people to, um, to prioritize what we think is important coming down a, a pipe, but you falls on deaf ears. Here was a real opportunity given all these other things where we put in hundreds of hours all the time and get nowhere, but this is a time where we really did put in a bunch of hours of making sure that we hit every community and talk to thousands of people about why this imp issue was important for us and why it should be important to them and how they wanted us to prioritize and going forward to set this process up. So after doing that for about two or three months, we came down to the three things that we wanted to have negotiated if we were gonna have asked uh, Metro Council to approve this deal was getting 20% affordable housing. And with the affordable housing, we wanted workforce uh, and family sized homes. And that being because in Nashville, a lot of things get labeled affordable housing but uh, you know, there are a lot of people, who, affordable housing in Nashville could be 15 to $1,800. And there are a lot of people with you know, their jobs that just can't afford that. So we want, and on top of that too, a lot of affordable housing isn't two, three or four bedroom uh, units. And you have a lot of families out here uh, who are looking for housing, but there is nothing that uh, uh, adequately suits them. So we talked about that. Uh, we talked about having a workforce development program to where we could really get people um, on pathways out of poverty. That's huge here in Nashville. A lot of people get stuck in uh, a lot of jobs here that lead to nowhere. So, I mean, they're working 30 and 40 hours a day and still living check to check. We have to find processes here that uh, can change that. And if Nashville Soccer one, um, uh, Holdings wanted to bring a team here, we wanted to make sure they prioritize that. And the last thing too was to be inclusive of the uh, cultural spaces. Nashville is known as the uh, music, the country, uh, music capital of the world. 
I'm a natural native and I do not like country music. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of other people here too that, you know, even if they like country music, there are other things and other aspects of the cultural life here that they want to be lifted up. So diversity was something huge and we wanted to make sure that the community spaces uh, were thoughtful of that when, going, uh, when they were building around the stadium. And another big thing that we got was uh, a daycare. And that was needed. I mean, I think across the country, we all have issues when we have to pay for daycare. You know, so can you imagine those who are working check to check and can barely uh, afford housing, how are they going to afford daycare when it's barely subsidized anywhere in the country anymore? Um, so with that, uh, one of the things that we had to do was hold really strong when, during negotiations to um, what we were really, what we were willing to down, you know, and affordable housing was one of those things, you know, we went back and forth and it was a very tenuous uh, process, uh, trying to get people to understand why it was uh, such an important thing and to understand that you adding affordable housing um, um, as one of the benefits of having the soccer stadium here isn't a detriment to you, it is a compliment to not only national soccer holders, but to the city. Um, so once we got to a place to where they understood that that is something that could happen, we were able then to start a dialogue, dialogue on how it would happen. So um, it was a lot of steps that took place in that. But one of the things that I would tell people is to stick to your guns. And that's not just on our side as well. That's for council people as well. So to all the council people that are out there listening, um, uh, I think we all have this stigma of corporation and big organizations and those people who have deep donor pockets, right? So uh, uh, you just have to stick to what you believe in and you have to just trust that the community and the people will back you up when you do those things. And that's exactly what happened uh, in this situation. We were able to convince 31 of the council people that this was a priority for Nashville and we had them all sign off on the letter saying that they would not uh, uh, approve a soccer stadium if they did not prioritize the community benefits agreement. So that went a long way in us uh, sitting at the negotiation table and getting a lot of these things worked out. Um, when it came to jobs, um, one of the things I can tell you is I have a really good lawyer. Uh, Carla Campbell was great. She was our, she's the attorney for Stand Up Nashville. And uh, she educated us on the whole process of what it would look like and the things that uh, were needed and the things that shouldn't be included in this deal for it to be a really good and, and a deal of quality. And we you just have to be patient and submit to going through the, uh, you know, everything that'll be asked of you. Um, other than that, I really don't know where to go in the conversation other in, unless people have questions. Kobe, is there anything else that I forgot that you want to fill in? No, I, I think that's I think that's an awesome summary of <laughs> what was a ton of work. Um, I think of this I can't that you can't underplay how much work was done by the community. The fact that they were going out to places well beyond. For those who aren't familiar, Nashville has 40 council members. We have 35 different geographic districts in our city county government. And so they were going out to places well beyond where the actual stadium footprint was going to be um, to make sure that community members were informed about the importance of this process. And I will say that one thing that has come out of this that's beyond just this particular agreement is that now it's not just myself, but other council members, when they are going to rezoning meetings or other kinds of projects that are happening in their district, what gets asked of them by community members are what is their community benefits agreement with this so it's a it's a pretty amazing thing that in a short amount of time that term even if it's not fully understood um has entered the lexicon here and that there becomes an expectation that there should be community benefits um on projects like this yeah that they reminded me too you know that uh your community benefits agreement was a big win but now that we're what two two months three months past the uh, the signing of the community benefits agreement, uh, I think it's helped Nashville in just what he's talking about the the narrative and how we navigate ourselves as a city. Uh, one of the things that I personally have you know someone I love Nashville I was born and raised uh, here in the city is that how do we define ourselves as a city? You know, and um, the fact that I think we're finally moving in unison as those who are elected officials. Some, not all, you know, it's, it's progress, work in progress. Uh, but especially those on Metro Council and um, 
those concerned citizens who are involved in the process uh, that we're starting to work in unison on how we build a city that we can all live in. You know, I mean, uh, not everyone's going to be rich, you know, uh, but not everyone has to be uh, definitely poor. And one of the, uh, the things is, is that the working class and the middle class are two very different things now. I'm working class, but I do not consider myself uh, the middle class. If I was to miss a couple of paychecks, I'd be in trouble. And I, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that. I work really hard and I work for uh, Metro government. That is just uh, because we're so stoked in the tradition, especially here in the South, that we have to understand that we have a right to make our own traditions. And I think that's gone a long way for the Metro Council as well. We have Amazon in front of us and a couple of other things that are coming up. And I think we're going to work uh, really well together and assigning the CBA set the footprint for, for us to start to do that. All right, we got a lot of questions coming in um, about the Nashville situation. So I think we, we can take one and then um, we'll get to our next speaker and we'll definitely hope to have time at the end for the rest of the questions. Okay. Um, so I see that uh, Mitra, do you have a question about the, the Nashville negotiations? Yeah, I do. I just put raise hand. I've like not really used Zoom before. So I'm going to click, I'm going to click off of that. <laughs> um, well, hi guys. Uh, I'm Mitra Jalali Nelson. I was just elected to the St. Paul City Council. Uh, I am representing a part of our city that opens up on basically kind of the doorstep of what our soccer stadium is going to be. There's a lot of parallels between um, what we're trying to do with Allianz Field and what I think it sounds like has uh, taken place in Nashville. So my question is really simple and it's just about um, you know, enforcing the CBA. This was clearly a really hard fought battle. It took thousands of hours of engagement. Um, the fact that you said you have 40 council members really blows my mind. We have seven here. So just the scale of the organizing work that you did uh, is just tremendous to me. And so now that you've built all this, uh, co uh, this, this base and this coalition of people and you have um, a CBA that's inked, you have it signed, it's been you know, approved, ratified, what do you see as the challenges ahead in terms of making it real? I'd love to hear um, your thoughts on what tools you need or what tools you feel like you fought for and um, other maybe challenges, political or otherwise, that, um, that you think you might encounter. Sorry if that's an exhausting question after you just came off a massive campaign. It's just, we've already signed our CBA, so I'm also thinking through how can we make this real for our community? I really appreciate any insights you have or questions even. It helps me think through mine too. Thanks. Uh, Kobe, you want to say anything before I take a stab at that? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll say the from our standpoint, Odessa will be able to talk about the enforceability of it because it's a private agreement. From my standpoint as a council member, um, the fact that this was so public, like the actual fact that people knew a CBA negotiation was taking place, creates a public expectation that will be followed through. From the actual enforcement, like the legal enforcement of it, I'll turn that over to Odessa. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, like you said, you, you guys now have a signed CBA, so hopefully you had a, uh, a lot of those things built into it. I cannot tout uh, Mia Chan and Carla Campbell enough. Um, the partnership with Working Families helped guide us through uh, this process. Um, Carla Campbell is our legal attorney here in Nashville, so she knows the lay of the land, and PWF knows how CBAs work. So uh, those two gave us a lot of guidelines on how to build some of this stuff in, and thankfully both of them are ready to sue at any point if, any, <laughs> if anything on this isn't... Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry about this, my dog. Thanks, Odessa. I would I would just quickly add that like one, it's a it's a legally enforceable contract between the parties, and two, um, building in a lot of best practices around enforcement are building in an enforcement body um, that's monitoring and providing oversight on CBA the CBA and making sure all of the provisions are delivered upon. Um, so a lot of cities kind of build in some kind of um, enforcement body that that has oversight powers and then can report to council. Yeah, and quickly, because I know we have to get to other people, and I'm excited to hear what they have to talk about as well. The other thing, too, is, is that a lot of the processes that are going to happen uh, throughout this, we made a joint committee. So that is like a community built uh, committee along with Nashville Soccer Holdings, Stand Up Nashville, and community people to make decisions on a lot of things that go forward. And I can go more. Thank you so much. 
Odessa and Colby, we're going to hopefully have time to go more into it because there are more questions, including how you ended up being a Seattle Seahawks fan being from Nashville. Um, but we can get to that later. Uh, so now um, I'm really pleased to be able to turn it over to Council Member Omar Narvaez from Dallas, who is going to talk to us about his recent negotiation with Amazon over a warehouse in his district and the really exciting um, standards that they were able to, to get secured for hiring and worker benefits there. So, Council Member. Hi there, everybody. Um, I, first of all, thank you for having me here. This is really exciting. Um, this negotiation was um, not my first as a council member. I just, I'm in my first term, 18 months, but it's um, the largest that I had to negotiate. Um, and what I would definitely start off with is um, if you haven't, get um, Richard Florida's book, Urban Crisis, and read it. Um, there's a lot of great information in there. We were lucky enough to have him uh, speak to our city council at our retreat earlier this year and um, really got into some nuts and bolts about things that are facing urban um, cities that, that are in an urban crisis and how we can navigate that and get through it. And one of the things that um, really stuck to me was um, when these businesses come in, these developers, but especially these big corporations, was make them a community partner. Um, there are ways to, you know, that they, they don't have to be the enemy. They um, can be a good partner, but you have to let them know what it is that you need, what it is that you want, um, and what it is that they need to do in order to move into your city um, and move and uh, be a good, be a good community partner. Um, so the first thing that I would stick, say was um, stick to your values. You know what your values are, um, uh, especially your progressive values, um, and don't be ashamed or afraid to voice those and let people know that they exist and what specifically they are. Um, know what your needs are in your community. Uh, you're all council members out there and you know, you know your community better than anybody else should know your community. Um, you definitely know it better than the big corporation that's coming in. So know what those needs are. Um, know what your assets and what your, um, um, what your, your um, commodities are in your district. So what do you have that this company, this organization that's wanting to come in, they're wanting to come in for a reason, but what do you have that they need in order to um, them to be productive and to be successful in order for your community to be productive and to be successful? Um, make sure that all of this stuff that you are, um, you have laid it out with your city staff, whomever is going to be helping you with the negotiation, whoever is going to be um, helping you champion your needs, your wants, um, and your cares. Then the next thing is um, be ready to compromise. Sometimes that's a little hard, especially when it comes to your progressive values, uh, you know, but you've got to be ready to compromise if it comes to that. And also be ready to walk away. If the deal isn't coming through the way you want it, the way it should be, um, be okay to fold the cards and say, we're done. Thank you so much. Um, have a nice day and you can move somewhere else. So um, if you don't mind switching the slide to what we ended up getting with Amazon in the city of Dallas. So the first one um, is we got 1,500 full-time new jobs at the Amazon Distribution Center, which is going to be located at Chalk Hill Road and I-30, which is in far west Dallas. Um, this is a, a neighborhood that um, is 70% uh, of the residents are living at or below the poverty level. And so one of the big things that I knew when I said know your assets and your commodities is that I had 1,500 people. I have definitely have more than this. This area is a highly... Um, uh, Hispanic and African American neighborhood um, area that um, is at double the po uh, I'm sorry, double the unemployment rate of the rest of the city of Dallas. So originally Amazon wanted to do the 1500 jobs um, to be part time jobs. And that was unacceptable, acceptable to me, because that was like, what, what's the point? Um, these folks are still going to end up in poverty, they're going to stay at poverty. And um, if they're only getting part time work, which also then means no benefits. So one of the first things that we add, asked for was that um, I asked for 50% of the hiring had to be local. Um, and going into compromising, we ended up compromising at 35%. In the city of Dallas, this was unheard of before. 
Um, so typically when we ask for um, local hiring, it's always 20%. That's just kind of the standard. And I thought, you know, that's not what I want. My folks need jobs. So let's go at 50. We ended up compromising at 35. Not a huge difference, um, but it was way, it's way bigger than the 20% that um, we typically normally would do. The next thing was um, living wages for employees. I started at 15. I'm a big proponent of the fight for 15. Um, and we started off at $10. And we eventually found out that, you know, when we, the warehouse jobs for distribution centers of this type in my district, that the average wage is $9.36 an hour, which is about $1.85 below the poverty level for the city of Dallas. 10 was unacceptable to me. And that this might sound ugly, but it's like my folks are already poor. Um, so if they had jobs that were gonna keep them poor, it's like they already are poor. So they're not gonna know a difference or feel a difference. And they shouldn't be required to um, take the scraps, to take the crumbs because, oh, we got a job. And um, it was one of those things that at this point, am I willing to walk away and let another city have this distribution center? or um, continue to, to fight for what I thought was right. We ended up settling at $13 to be the floor with $15 being the average um, for the uh, jobs in this distribution center. We voted on this on a Wednesday and the following Monday, Amazon announced that they were raising the minimum wage to $15 across the entire uh, nation. So we ended up getting the $15 an hour that I was advocating for and fighting for and so that was really exciting for us because we did, you know, start, we did compromise with 13, but we ended up winning what we wanted. The next thing that came up through our negotiation was uh, full benefits for all employees. So your medical, your dental, your um, um, retirement, everything that you would get in another um, standard corporation. Um, this is a trillion dollar company. And the, 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 for them to say that they wouldn't give benefits was unacceptable and was something we had to negotiate in. Also, this is something that um, I think is important was that the drain that it, it puts on our county and our health and human services department, our school district, everything that trickles down from these folks being in poverty with 11.15 an hour being the um, top of poverty uh, rate for the city of Dallas. So at 15, we comfortably get people, you know, they're not gonna be rich. They're not gonna, you know, they're still gonna be workers. They're gonna be hardworking uh, families, but at 15, at least they have a little bit of breathing room. But this also ends up benefiting the entire area because now folks that have been living in impoverished neighborhoods now might have a little bit of extra money to paint their home, fix the tires on their car, get an oil change, maybe take the, you know, the kids out for, dinner, you know, um, go to the zoo, things that they may have felt that they've never been able to do because at either no money or even at 10 bucks an hour, they still couldn't afford in the city of Dallas. So we see this um, helping everybody. And then we do have a lot of warehouses, distribution type warehouses in the area. Um, $9.36 is now not going to be the average because um, a lot of folks, a lot of talent in these warehouses are going to jump ship to go work for the um, full benefits and the $15 an hour jobs, that's the starting rate um, at the Amazon distribution center, which now means all these other warehouse type jobs are gonna have to either um, raise their benefits, raise their hours to full time, give more money, um, a lot of things that will help improve everybody's um, situation in the area. And then the next thing that we had, <clears throat> and it, I don't know who's in control, can click enter thank you, um, is employment plan for hiring of formerly incarcerated people. That was a um, big one for me that we had to have in our, um, in our negotiation plan. And I thought it was gonna be the hard one to get them to um, get through. And um, kind of wildly, uh, Amazon quickly agreed to that one. It, the, the place where we had the biggest struggle was the, the wages and that the jobs would be, uh, would be full time. Um, but other than that, it, you know, this ended up being a really great negotiation. Um, and I kept to those things of how do we make Amazon be a um, partner in the community as well as knowing what we had. So knowing what we had, we had the people. Knowing um, that these folks needed jobs, they had the jobs. Knowing that we could walk away from this. And, you know, and they did threaten at one point. And this all was going on when the HQ2 um, 
deals were uh, on the table. And even my own city staff was trying to push me to compromise faster and not push so hard because they were worried that this would send HQ2 somewhere else. And my response back to staff was if they don't want to negotiate and pay employees right for a distribution center, how are we going to get HQ2 to be right? Um, you know, and, and in, in the end, we didn't get that HQ2. We got what I always thought what, what it was, was we got a consolation prize for being in the running, which was this um, distribution center. But if you're not going to be prepared to stand up to um, the big giant uh, uh, corporation, then what are you going to do for your people? What are they going to do and how are they going to treat your folks and your residents? So at the end of the day, when we got to announce this to my community, um, people were so, they were ecstatic. Like, I kid you not, I now have probably 300 folks um, already in my email queues that want a job, who are ready to, to apply. They want to know when, when they can start applying. And a year from now, they'll get to start um, applying because in uh, January, February-ish of 2020 is when the distribution center opens. And this is exciting because it's what the community wanted. It's the wages that they needed, the benefits that they desire and the jobs that they want. And so at the end of the day, we, uh, we are getting ready to um, finish, or begin to start to write and finish up writing our first ever economic deve development plan. And um, some of the stuff that we were able to put in here, staff has already told me they are going to be putting into our eco dev plan uh, that we will permanently create um, going forward. And other council members were very, ecstatic and excited, especially with the percent of local hiring. If I'm giving you city money and city pack of Dallas taxpayer dollars to come in, um, this 30, you know, 20% really is the lowest of the low. So shoot for hire if you can and uh, make sure that your residents are getting hired um, to, to be able to work. And at the end of the day, this deal um, cost us $1.3 million for the city of Dallas. Um, the original way it was going to take about four years for it to pay itself back. Um, now with the negotiation that we were able to do literally in one year, the city of Dallas will get all of its dollars back and our benefits of the money that we're putting in. So this ended up being a win-win for um, the city, Amazon, as well as the residents of District 6. And if anybody has questions, um, please let me know. Uh, Omar, we have one question um, that I'd like you to answer, and then we'll we'll go to our last speaker and hopefully have more time for questions at the end. But uh, we have a question: How are you able to define local uh, for the deal, and was it defined in a way um, where people who qualified for that were already living there, um, or does it include people who moved in to be employed as well? So uh, when we we define local as city of Dallas, so if you live in the city of Dallas, that defines local. So this this um, is actually a little tougher for Amazon because the um, the warehouse distribution center actually sits on the border of two other cities, so Grand Prairie and the city of Irving, which are literally just to the west, maybe three quarters of a mile to the west of me. So that's how we define local for the city of Dallas is them being um, city of Dallas residents. Great, thank you. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, you can submit a question through the Q&A or raise your hand with the button on the interface. Um, so now uh, I want to turn it over to Councilman Bill Henry in Baltimore. And Councilman Henry is going to talk to us about the Port Covington deal. Um, that was a huge development deal in Baltimore and some of the lessons that he and the city learned coming out of that situation. So thank you for being with us, Bill. All right, thank you, Ari, and um, also thank you to Odessa for being brave enough to admit that you can live in Nashville and not like country music. I, uh, I, I, I've grown up in Baltimore, which is known uh, nationally, if not internationally, for steamed crabs, and I hate sitting and picking crabs. Um, so I, I feel like this, uh, I'm glad this is a safe space where we can share that kind of information. Um, I also want to thank all the other presenters because uh, you've, you've shown uh, what I think are some examples of success, um, and I, I suspect that I might be here on this panel to be the cautionary tale of uh, what, what happens if 
you if your if your process doesn't turn out the way you want it to turn out. And I, I got to say, as a guy with a hundred and thirty six million dollar community benefits agreement, uh, I know it might sound a little weird to say that I don't know I'm happy with how it turned out, but uh, you need a little perspective for that. And so here's the perspective. Oh, and Ari, right, this is great. I didn't have any slides, so you made slides. Thank you. Um, so what you're looking at down there uh, in the bottom is uh, how gorgeous Port Covington would be. And I mean, Port Covington, when you listen to the description of it, sounds like a great idea. And I honestly hope that it really will be. Um, it's complete. It'll be an investment into our city of about six billion dollars worth of private funds and another billion and a half of public infrastructure and that includes a 660 million dollar tax increment financing deal which is why we're here um, to put this uh what you're seeing down there on the screen into perspective uh we're talking about a project that's 235 acres or about 45 city blocks uh, it includes two and a half miles of restored waterfront and uh, over 40 acres of new parks. Uh, it'll have, when it's completed, 14.1 million square feet of mixed-use development, including a $3.9 million global head, I'm sorry, 3.9 million square foot global headquarters for Under Armour, uh, a new light rail station, and a score of next generation manufacturing centers and startup spaces. Uh, and the fact that uh, that three, that's right, that $660 million TIF uh, got us a $136 million community benefits agreement from the developer sounds great. Um, a big chunk of that money is going to go uh, directly to benefit the six communities most adjacent to the project. And um, like the other community benefit agreements I talked about, uh, this was uh, an agreement that was negotiated over a span of months. Uh, I don't know if this is different than in other places, but uh, Sagamore, which is the developer, it, it was an entity that was soft under itself and Kevin Plank as, individual, as an individual uh, were not the development entities. It's a separate development entity. Uh, Sagamore act came to the city with a community benefits agreement. And before they had even uh, sat down and had extensive conversations with the community and with issue advocates, much less the city council, before the bill even came to us, they are already offering a community benefits agreement. Um, so the, I will say that is positive, that there is an understanding now in the development community here in Baltimore that if you're gonna do a big project that's going to require a big tax increment financing deal from the city, you are just flatly expected to provide some level of community benefits agreement. Um, the agreement also includes the establishment of a supportive services center where residents from surrounding communities can get assistance with job skill development, resume creation, and employment searches. Uh, there is a provision that 30% of the infrastructure work will be performed by city residents. These jobs will pay a minimum of $24 an hour with sort of payroll requirements imposed on all the contractors. And there's an inclusionary housing requirement wherein 20 of all the residential units being constructed will be affordable uh, at uh, some level of ability below 80% uh, AMI. 60% of those units will be within Port Covington itself, while the remaining 40% can be offsite in other parts of the city, which um, was actually a, a, a negotiation with one of the coalitions of community groups and nonprofits that worked on this community benefits agreement, where the developer will be partnering with them to develop affordable housing elsewhere in the city so that all the affordable housing isn't just concentrated down here in, um, in Port Covington. So um, on the, on the, uh, when, you, when you lay it out like that, I have to admit it sounds pretty good. 
um, there were still some concerns uh, that uh, many of us had at the point where uh, Port Covington's deal was concluded. Um, one of those concerns had to do with uh, another part of the community benefits agreement, which was that there would be a profit sharing agreement. Um, there were concerns that other deals that the city had helped out over the years had made a lot more money than they said they were going to make in the original documents in which they asked the city for help. And so there was an expectation that there would be a profit sharing agreement so that if the project turns out to be more profitable than projected, uh, the city as a substantial investor in it would get to share in that profit. Um, Initially, one of the reasons why I abstained on this project when the bills finally became, came before the council for a final vote was because they still had not shown us what the details of the profit sharing agreement were. And um, for better or for worse, two years later, uh, there still is no actual detailed signed profit sharing agreement between the city and the developer. And I'm honestly not sure at this point how you get one um, because now that we're into the project, I don't know what leverage we have on the developer to actually get them to, to conclude this. Um, the second part of this, which is one of those, it sounds like a good deal, but then when you start digging into it, um, the, uh, the affordable housing commitment in the community benefits agreement, when what I, what I read out to you was the summary of it. And, and you know, the summary that 20% would be affordable and 60% must be within Port Covington. When you actually get into the, the letter of the language in the agreement, um, we circulated that agreement among a number of housing professionals and there was disagreement among them as to how that section would be interpreted if we ever get to the point where we're trying to enforce it. The summary paints a very positive description of how much uh, affordable housing the project will provide sort of in a best case scenario, but the actual language of the commitment is far less concrete and there's a very good chance that um, if things do not go as hoped we could end up with a substantial number of market rate units down there but without anywhere near the level of affordable units um, to balance them that people came away from the deal feeling like had been committed. Um, and, and it's that very um, discrepancy between how, what the deal you think you got and what you actually have later on when you're, um, you're adding up everything and trying to enforce it. Um, the first suggestion I would have or lesson learned that I would offer is take your time. Do not ever let yourself be pressured into agreeing to a deal that you're not totally comfortable with defending. Um, we spent about 18 weeks on this, um, on this bill and it was the largest by far uh, tax increment financing deal that the city of Baltimore has ever done. Um, we had taken more time with smaller, less controversial uh, projects in the past, but there was time pressure on this one um, that I believe the council fell victim to, and um, I would encourage uh, council people in other cities to resist giving in to that external time pressure. Um, the second thing that I would offer um, as a suggestion is um, especially if you don't yourself have a background in real estate development, um, the situation we found that we found ourselves in as council people um, was that a lot of the um, 
issue advocates who were being most involved and successful at being loudest in the negotiations um, around this bill and the community benefits agreement, a lot of them were housing advocates who, whose experience is with the need. Like they work with people who need housing. And so they're very aware of how much housing, um, affordable housing vulnerability doesn't have. And they're looking for opportunities to create more, which is laudable and it's a goal I agree with, but they're not always necessarily um, people who have experience and um, uh, a, a wealth of knowledge on the details of actually creating additional uh, affordable housing. And so no, I'm that's sorry where. To cut in, but we, ooh, sorry yeah, to cut in, but we have like just a minute left. Um, so uh, the, the last I, thing, just make sure you use your use your CDCs and your nonprofit development experts. They can they can help you out in your negotiations. Thank you so much. Um, and I I hope that I can say that all of our speakers today are. Um, are definitely willing to, to talk with folks or answer questions that you have that weren't coming up today. I think we have time for one last question and I, Odessa has been doing amazing answering some of the questions in the chat. So make sure you look at that if you haven't already. But Odessa, do you wanna field the question about how you got so much community consensus in such a short time? You might be on mute. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, okay, so uh, Stand Up Nashville has been around uh, for about two years now. So uh, we worked really hard and we were very diligent uh, about making sure that um, we had a good reputation uh, in the community before we even picked a campaign uh, to really go hard after. Uh, I think uh, the first campaign that we ever went after, which was the Do Better Bill, which is for more transparency in local government by public dollars, it took us a year and a half maybe you know a little yeah about a year and a half um maybe 14 months to even get to that because we wanted to make sure that we had the buy-in of the community um in uh, first of all um as far as to the nego negotiations i think um yeah i think because of everything else that happened with the hospital um with transit you know uh, with transit failing we found out that the, you know the city was broke <laughs> so I, th I think that uh, there were a lot of things that were going on to lead to that. So just using that in the timetable that um, uh, National Soccer was up against before they had to start paying money out, um, you know, to, to stay on their timeline for building this thing out for whatever they promised to MLS, we used that as leverage to get this done, you know. And I think it was, I mean, you can ask Kobe if he's still on again, it was an overall consensus of the city that we needed to prioritize um, doing the community benefits agreement, if the soccer was ever going to happen. So I think that put a lot of pressure on those who make the wheels turn to be like, you need to sign this and get this done ASAP. So we are bumping up on our time limit here. Um, we're going to send out a recap of this. Uh, we have a recording and we'll send out the, the questions and answers that people asked, including the ones that we didn't get to. And we'll make sure you get an answer there. Um, including Jared, I see that you asked a question, so we'll make sure we get you that answer. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. We will definitely do more of this type of thing. Um, shout out to Indianapolis, Chicago, Albany, Florida, Maine, Berkeley. So many places joined the call today. So Denver, Tempe, uh, so many more. I can't even keep up with all of it. So thank you, everybody. Um, and hopefully you, you found this valuable and can take some stuff with you. And please get in touch with us at Local Progress if you want to talk more about any of these topics. So thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.